Hello everyone, this is Brett with eCats Miniatures, and we are carrying on with the faction overviews. So today we're going to be covering the Baratheons, and I have with me my very special guest, the Baratheon expert himself. We have Shevster from Poland. How are you doing today? Hey Brett, I'm doing fine, thank you. And I really appreciate uh, being, here, uh, being here with you today. Absolutely. I would consider you a very strong pillar of the community. You are someone that plays competitively and casually, and I've seen that you're doing those videos on Facebook out of the kindness of your heart, kind of helping those Baratheon players along. So we hope to carry on with a little bit of that today and with the Renly video, which you should keep an eye out for, uh, and we will get to just why here in just a second. Um, essentially, when we're talking about the Baratheons, it's almost like buying into two armies at one. You've got the Renly side, you've got the Stannis side. There are units, NCUs, commanders, and things like this, attachments that are specific to one of those sides. If you have something that is specifically loyalty Renly, you can't have loyalty Stannis. And that goes vice versa. Yes, we have almost two factions in one. One faction is Stannis side, and the other is Renly side. And about these factions, many factions into a faction, right? Uh, the Stannis side is very aggressive, grindy style. They are very aggressive, they like to be engaged. They do wounds to uh, their units just to make enemies suffer more. And the Renly is the opposite. Renly likes to keep unit on the battlefield. So he's all about healing and keeping your units uh, in uh, good shape, right? And not only commanders, but also units and its use have ability to heal something on the battlefield. So in the quick sum up, Stan is aggressive and sacrificing his units, friendly, uh, gentle and keeping his units on the battlefield. Yep, that Renly side is all about that attrition warfare, and they do it arguably better than anyone in the game. Um, but today we're going to be talking about Stannis, so I just want to remind you again, we have chosen to split these overviews into a Stannis side and a Renly side because there is so much information this video would have been incredibly long if we did both sides. But today we're going to be talking about Stannis, and that Stannis side is very much the aggressive side, very much even if it costs you some of your own troops, we're Baratheons, we're very well armored, or we're protected by our high morale in the case of those faithful units. Um, and I think that it works really well for them. Um, what would you say? Do you say that the, the, the costs, the risks, do you think they pay off for the Stannis side? Because in my opinion, Stannis is the more competitive side. Yes, the Stannis is the more competitive side, and I think that uh, this, this side is better if you want to play good, aggressive game, and also if you want sometimes just to wipe your, uh, your opponent out from the battlefield. And if it pays off, yes, it pays off, because you might be sacrificing your units, but you have options to heal, uh, and the sacrificing uh, when you sacrifice your units your opponents suffer double uh, amount of wounds that you sacrifice it so maybe you will lose one or two models but enemy probably will lose four on or five depending on what ability we use if you use uh, we can use units and attachments to put the tokens out and we can just force an enemy to uh, do a very very hard to pass planning test yeah absolutely and of course we will cover the units that transition to both the stannis and the rinley side but i cannot wait to get cracking in to these stannis specific units with you i am very excited all right so let's get to it okay i'm ready let's go Without further ado, we're going to start cracking into the combat units. So we'll start with the units that are shared between that Renly faction and that Stannis faction. And our very first unit that we're going to review is what would be considered the premier house Baratheon unit. It's, it's the unit that comes with two in the starter set. It's what you kind of think of when you think of Baratheons. We are, of course, talking about the Baratheon Wardens. Coming in at five points, they are a speed four, 
they have the Warhammer uh, as an attack ability, which is a 6-5-4 hitting on a 4+. plus. Their defense is a 3+, plus. their morale is a 6+. plus. In terms of abilities, they have the attack ability Warhammer. If the defender rolls a 1 on any defense dice after this attack is completed, they become weakened, and then they carry Counter Strike. Each time this unit is attacked with a melee attack for each miss, the attacker suffers one hit. So the first thing that's jumping out to me about these guys there is that they're a little bit slow, but that is a very stout defensive profile for, for five points. Um, additionally, they have ways to create their own weakened tokens. Now, granted, it comes with some stipulation, but it is possible, and that pairs perfectly with Counter-Strike, which anybody who's played the game and faced this ability, we know that those Counter-Strike hits can really add up, and they can create a situation where it's almost like having a free attack to some degree because you're able to damage your enemy because they dare to attack you. What do you make of the Wardens? Um, am I overhyping them, or are they really just a phenomenal five-point unit? I think that they are phenomenal five-point unit. They are perfect roadblock to keep your flank uh, protected. They have amazing uh, defensive stats. I think that there are not many, even seven-point units that have three plus armor. Uh, and ab about their attack profile, that does not matter that they attack on 4 plus with 6 dice because, as you said, Warhammer and Counter-Strike is a perfect combination. If, if you manage to put a weekend token up on your enemy, they will think for twice before attacking the Wardens because that attack can make more damage to themselves than the, to the Wardens. And they work great alone, naked, on the battlefield. But if you want to boost their uh, defensive uh, abilities, you can put some commander unit because it's uh, that unit is a perfect commander bunker. Okay, yeah, that sounds really nice. Um, and that's exactly what I would expect from this unit. They are, you know, as I said, they're a premier defensive unit. They're coming in at five points. And I think they could just be something that covers many roles. Um, so we can move on to the next unit that comes in the starter box, another shared unit. We're on to the Baratheon Sentinels. These guys are coming in at six points. They are a speed of five. They are carrying double hammers, which is an attack profile of seven, six, four, hitting on a four plus. Their defense is four plus, their morale is six plus. They bring the order Sentinel. After another friendly unit in long range is attacked, this unit performs one charge or maneuver action. If it's charging, you must target the attacker and then the double hammers bring the attack ability center. So the initial glance at these guys wants me to believe that they are your hammer. They're your, uh, no pun intended, they're your offensive hammer. They're bringing the <laughs> sundering keyword to help you get through enemy armor. And then they're adding a little bit more of this retribution, kind of this, um, you know, you attack me, you try to hurt me, something bad happens to you. Uh, we might see more of that in the Baratheon identity. What do you think of the Sentinels? Okay, on the paper, they look fine, and you look at the models, and they are great. But to be honest, that Order Sentinel does not meet an expectation. Uh, the Order, uh, you can only use it when your enemy allows you to do it. And having that Order Sentinel makes them primarily target for the enemy attacks. So they should be a hammer. <laughs> of our army, but uh, in practice they are fierce to die, unfortunately. I don't see uh, having sentinels in my list because I think that it's better to take another unit for six points or even wardens with some attachment. Yeah, I can absolutely see that and the four plus six plus defense is a little bit is a little bit less than what you're getting out of those wardens, so I can certainly see it, but I encourage uh, the listeners to give them a try. Maybe there's some type of list archetype that you know of where you've gotten Sentinels to work. Feel free to drop that in the comments and give us your thoughts on Sentinels, but we're giving them a grade of, of somewhere in between. They look, they look great on paper, and I think if they're used properly, they could be really good, but for the most part, as you mentioned, I think, you know, you might want to just look into beefing up your uh, Baratheon Wardens with a more offensive attachment. So we'll move on to the last infantry that's shared between the two loyalties, and what an infantry unit this is. We have the Stag Knights. They're coming in at 8 points. They are a speed 5. 
They have Stax Fury as their attack ability. It hits on a 3+, plus and it's 777 across all ranks, so the attack dice never fall off. Their defense is a 4+, plus and that morale value is a 5, which is a pretty elite defensive profile. They bring the Order Resilience. When an enemy is performing an attack on this unit after attack dice are rolled, this unit only suffers one wound for every two unblocked hits. And then for their attack abilities, they have Stax Fury. This attack gains the following based on the game round, and the effects are cumulative. Starting in round two, they will get Critical Blow, then round three, Vicious, round four, Sundering, round five to six, they will deal plus one hit for each of these units' remaining ranks. So these guys on paper look like an absolute boss of a unit. That four plus five plus defense profile is really bolstered by that resilience order. It's pretty much forcing your opponent to double team these guys, whether that's with two melee attacks in a round, or if it's, you know, a ranged volley followed by some kind of melee attack. I think you're going to have a really hard time getting through these guys if you try to one-on-one -on -one them. As the game goes on, it looks like they're punishing you for kind of ignoring them as their defense or their attack profile is just going to get completely out of hand. So what's going on with these guys? Because they look so good on paper, but I'm just not seeing them played. Okay, first of all, uh, we're going to look at their, their models. And uh, their models are absolutely amazing. Very heavy armored unit with double uh, with big hammer. I love them. And about uh, that unit in the game, uh, they are great. They're looking great. They have perfect uh, abilities. Resilience really uh, help help them keep on uh, keep on the battlefield. Uh, but for the eight points, you really want. You have options to take cavalry, and as you know, the cavalry have free maneuver, and I think that keeps them off the table. Because if you're paying eight points, you rather would take just cavalry unit to get this free maneuver, which we know it's very pow powerful ability. But I encourage everyone to try them with uh, Axel Commander, because that really helps them with offensive abilities. Yeah, and I, I, th I think they can be nice. It's just going to be a difficult matter of how you get them involved in the battle. Now, I played, uh, just quickly to touch on it, I played against a local player that played Stag Knights. And he did really well with them because he sold out to taking the maneuver zone no matter what. And even giving up the wealth zone, giving up the free attack, giving up the letters when he had to. And because he sold out so much to the Maneuver Zone, he was able to keep them at the battle at all times. So that is something to consider. If you want to make these guys work, I think you have to do something like that, where you make your entire battle plan about keeping them involved. So moving on from the Stag Knights, which absolutely beautiful models, as you mentioned, we go to the final unit that is a shared loyalty. We're on to the champions of the Stag, another Manam... <laughs> Excuse me, another phenomenal sculpt coming from the Simon <laughs> team for these Baratheon guys. Arguably the best sculpts in the game are for the Baratheons. These guys do not disappoint. They are the champions of the stag. They are a speed four. They have the champion's wrath attack ability, which hits on a three plus, throwing six and four attack dice. Their defense is an amazing two plus, And then you see a six plus defensive profile. They are bringing... The Cavalry Innate Ability, which is pretty well the same across all Cavalry units. You'll see some exceptions, like the Bear Riders are bringing four wounds per model. For the most part, this is the one time in this overview that we're going to cover the Cavalry Ability. Uh, each model in this unit has three wounds. At the start of this unit's activation, it may perform one maneuver action. Then it's bringing Champion's Wrath as an attack ability. And this is where the Champions of the Stag shine. They have Critical Blow at all times. Enemies successfully charged become weakened. If this unit began the turn engaged with the defender before rolling attack dice, the defender becomes vulnerable. So that's a lot, little bit to unpack there, but it looks to me like if the champions of the stag are attacking, no matter what, you are picking up a condition token. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. If you allow them to uh, be charged by them, you'll get a weakened token. If you start engaged with them because you charge champions of the stack, you get the vulnerable token, so you cannot do anything and you still will get the token. 
and in my opinion that's a hammer and anvil in Bartionis because they are unmovable and can uh, they can push damage and just one uh, win the one uh, versus one fight or even one versus two with their amazing armor to plus and if you put uh, some attachments with them like glory seeker we got absolute beast that ca cannot be taken off the table with two plus armor five plus morale and they will take one less wound if they fail the panic test and yeah their model are great yeah, these guys just for me, they look absolutely terrifying because the, the key takeaway from these guys is they actually defy what you normally tend to think with heavy cavalry. Generally with heavy cavalry, you're trying to intercept them and get the charge on them uh, to stop their, you know, rerolls and stop their ability. I think in so many cases with Champions of the Stag, as scary as it seems, you might be better in terms of how much damage they do by letting them charge you, because that vulnerable token, when they begin the turn engaged with you, every time they're attacking you, really, really pushes their damage to another level. Um, these guys get a massive, massive thumbs up from me. Um, they're a little bit slow, but they will get there. Um, what do you make of the Champions of the Stag? I am taking Champions of the Stack in my every list because uh, they are just too tanky to not take them. And as you said, uh, uh, Free Maneuver really keeps them uh, b uh, to be in a fight because, okay, they are they have four each uh, movement, but they can do a Free Maneuver. And usually they just keep one of your flank uh, un unchargeable. Uh, they are they're protecting your flank, uh, and if someone thinks to try to pass by them, they will have a bad time. Absolutely, I agree, and I, I think they're nearly impossible to one-on-one, -on -one, making them the premier defensive unit in the game. So now we will move on from the combined units, and we're going to take our first look at the Stannis Loyalty. As we go through these, I think you're going to see some of that Stannis aggressive and panic playstyle show through in the units that belong to Stannis. So starting off, we begin with the Relore Faithful. These guys are coming in at six points. They are a speed five. They're bringing the Sword of the Faith. Uh, that is a seven, six, four hitting on a four plus. Their defense is five plus with an exceptional morale value of four plus. Then we move on to what really makes these guys tick, the Heart of Fire ability. This unit begins the game with one faith token. Each time it passes a morale test, it gains one faith token. Faith tokens may be expended to do the following. When an enemy engaged with this unit performs an attack before resolving that attack. For each of this unit's destroyed ranks, the attack attacker suffers three hits. When this unit performs a melee attack before rolling attack dice, this attack gains precision and vicious. When this unit is destroyed, one other unit in long range, one other, excuse me, one other Ray Lore unit in long range performs one attack action. This is a lot to unpack here. Um, to me, these guys look like um, their five plus defense might put a lot of people off, but I think that's shored up by their really, really sturdy morale of four plus. And then this Heart of Fire ability seems really, really strong to me. Um, Essentially, when you're attacking them with a melee attack, if they have any destroyed ranks, you're taking hits. And it's not just a few hits, it's three hits for one destroyed rank and six if you're attacking them at the last rank. There are situations where getting into a melee with these guys, you could literally just die from attacking. Uh, what do you make of the Relore Faithful? I think that's a very good six-point unit, uh, and I think that they are perfect. Uh, to play against giants because they have precision and uh, that really help, helps to go through the units that have uh, built-in resilience like giants, uh, uh, units with hardened, units with resilience order. Uh, okay, they have 5 plus armor, but the, uh, their more morale is 4 plus and that will help uh, keeps them alive on the battlefield, especially when uh, Baratheons have stuff that uh, ha heal units after passing a moral test. And they are perfect with Melisandre and Sue, and also uh, they are perfect if you have another uh, archers, lightbringers, 
uh, in long range because they can pick a fight, do some wounds, do some damage, do some actions, and when they die, you can just do a free attack. And as we know, range attacks in these games are powerful. Absolutely. So looking at these guys, they're getting a thumbs up for me, especially if you're building some type of themed relore list. These guys feel like a must have. And moving on to the next unit for the Stannis Loyalty, which is also a Raylor unit, we're looking at the Raylor Lightbringers. These guys are coming in at six points. Uh, they are bringing a speed of five. They have fire arrows, which fire long range with a an amazing 764 range profile hitting on a three plus. They have a melee attack profile, which is daggers. They hit on a five plus, and that's only a five four three. Uh, the archers are one of the few exceptions in the game where they can drop to three dice, but you don't want your archers in melee anyway. Um, and then we've got a defense of four plus and a six plus morale, which is very, very good for archers. And then fire arrows. This ability is only for the ranged attack. It is vicious. If the defender fails their panic test, target one other enemy in short range of that unit. They suffer one panic test with minus two to their roll. Is it just me, or are these possibly the best ranged unit in the game? These guys just look phenomenal, and they have to be so scary for anyone that does not have sturdy morale value across their army. And I'm gonna agree with you, they are one of the best arch uh, unit in the game. I think that they are. They can w win every one versus one range fight uh, with that great uh, defense profile and great attack profile supported by uh, amazing vicious uh, ability and also playing against them you cannot uh, be 100% sure about your units because that panic uh, bones ca uh, can target your units that are out of fight uh, if you want to uh, keep your unit uh, like behind your lines uh, so they won't be hurt like this is unit with supply A that needs to be in shape to heal other units uh, Lightbringers can just attack uh, some frontliners and then uh, jump the panic test with minus two on that unit that are is behind uh, they are great with brawn they are great with uh, Davos attachment, they are perfect for six points. I absolutely agree, and I very rarely play Baratheons, but when I do play Baratheons, it is 100% stand aside, and I absolutely love running these guys. They are such a menace, such a strong unit. Um, so, moving on from them, uh, because we'll go into some of the combos that you can pull with these guys, just the sheer amount of panic tests. And there's so many chains that you can set off with these guys. We're not going to go into it right now. But as you and I delve deeper into some of the Baratheon strategies, we'll bring to light some of the phenomenal combos that you can pull with that unit. Uh, so we will move on now to the Kingsmen. And I think it goes without saying, with the Relore Faithful, the Lightbringers, additionally phenomenal models. Kingsmen, they might be my favorite sculpt in the game. I love how dynamic these guys look. I love their armor mixed with their little tabard and everything they have going on their swords are intricate and beautiful i absolutely love these models they are coming in at seven points and they are a speed of five their attack profile is the king's blade it is a seven six four hitting on a three plus they are a four plus defense with a six plus morale they bring the ability to the last which is an innate ability Place two heart tokens on this card at the start of the game. Each time this unit would be destroyed, remove one token from this card. It makes one morale test. On a success, this unit is not destroyed but remains in play with one wound. Then the King's Blade ability. Before rolling attack dice, you may search your tactics deck or discard pile for one hours as the Fury card and play it. Or add it to your hand. Shuffle your tactics deck. Seems like a really cool unit with a number of really nice abilities. They're able to help you cycle through your deck, drawing ours as the Fury out if you haven't pulled it into your hand already. That, of course, helps you cycle through your cards and get some of the cards that might be buried. Additionally, it's got the ability to recycle that card every time they attack, which can't be overstated. This is every time the unit attacks. 
Um, and then additionally, we've seen recently in the FAQ, our, our friends on the design team, Michael Chanel and Fabio, have given you explicit permission to play a card like Sustained Assault and combine that with Ours is the Fury because this King's Blade is giving you permission to go ahead and play that card. Uh, what do you make of the Kingsmen? How are you using them? Okay, uh, first of all, yeah, the models uh, are great and they have long swords, uh, King's Blade, to be honest, and I love the, uh, their models, uh, but I cannot find a place for King's Blade in my list because, uh, to be honest, uh, 4 plus armor and 6 plus moral is not enough for uh, a lead uh, infantry unit for 7 point. Uh, I s uh, sometimes play with them in casual games and then uh, I stick a uh, one true king or axle commander in them to boost the morale to keep them on the battlefield. Uh, and as you said, we can play sustain assault and then draw always the fury to boost our attack. So they look nice uh, in casual game when you can just uh, go around and so uh, seven dice, two plus, thundering wishes, <laughs> and go through enemy light armor tunes like it's a hot, ni a hot knife in a butter. Yeah, absolutely. They look to me like they are, in fact, maybe the premier offensive infantry unit for the stand aside because of their ability to pull that card. And when we get into the tactics deck overview, you'll see just how powerful that card is. I really like these guys with the Axel Commander but I can absolutely understand what you are saying. So for all of our listeners, let us know if you're having any luck with the Kingsmen um, and if you love them as much as I do. I quite like them, but I can understand exactly where you're coming from. So we will now move on to the counterpart to the Kingsmen, which is the Relore Queensmen. These guys are also coming in at a seven point and they would be the Anvil to the Kingsmen Hammer. These guys are a speed four, they're bringing the Longsword, which is a 7-6-4 hitting on a 3+. Their defensive profile is super elite at a 3-plus defense with a 5-plus morale. They bring the same to the last ability. It's identical to what the Kingsmen bring. And similarly to the, the um, Kingsmen, they are bringing the Queen's Blade Order. When a friendly Raylor unit in short range is attacked before rolling attack dice, search your, search your tactics deck or discard pile for one Baratheon Justice card and add it to your hand. Shuffle your tactics deck. Now, a couple of things to unpack here. This one is an order, unlike the King's Blade, which happens every time they attack. And keeping in mind that all units are always considered in friendly, in short range of themselves, unless it specifically states other units. So attacking the Queen's men can trigger this order on themselves. Um, finally, to unpack this, this is supposed to happen before rolling attack dice. Now, quite often, this trigger is missed. For the most part, opponents are very nice and cool about it, and they let you go ahead and pull that card. But just as a point of following the rules to the T, you want to make sure that you're declaring that you're going to pull this card before your opponent rolls attack dice, just to keep yourself from having any issues. Um, so all of that said, Shevster, my friend, what do we make of the Queensman? I love Queensman, to be honest. I think that this is one of the best Bartian units, and I use them in every list. And sometimes I even use two units of Queensman uh, playing some games. They have a lead uh, defense profile, 3 plus armor, 5 plus morale. That's amazing. And as you mentioned, they pull off uh, the Bartian Justice card, and you can always play it after enemy and uh, completes enemy attack, so uh, before your enemy attacks you, you pull this card, and after enemy is an attack, you just pa uh, put a bunch of tokens on enemy. Uh, <laughs> retribution style, right? Absolutely. And they are fantastic with almost every Baratheon uh, style side commanders. Because every Baratheon commander gives them something that enemy should uh, be aware of. Uh, some better defense, some better attack, uh, some wounds, and uh, they are great. And to be honest, their, uh, their model are also fantastic. 
Yep, and again, that's a theme across all of Baratheons. I think you could make a case for the Baratheons having the best models in the game. Possibly why the Baratheons have such a loyal following among players that play them in person. They, It's just kind of crazy. It's like once you go Baratheon and you sell out to that loyalty, you never go back. And it's, I have to attribute a lot of that to the models because they just look so fantastic. Um, moving on to... Now, this is the only solo that is available for the Baratheons. It's exclusive to the Stannis side. This guy is very special to my heart. I have a love-hate relationship with this guy. I absolutely love him for what he brings to the list in terms of activations, a little bit of mobility, and a threat that can catch people off guard. I absolutely hate when he catches a pre precision spike and dies to his first charge and I don't get to use him. This is the Dragonstone Noble. He is coming in at four points. Uh, he is a speed of four, and he brings the Noble's Wrath, which is three attack dice hitting on a three plus. His defense is a two plus, and his morale is a three plus. For those keeping track at home, he is more defensive than the mountain that rides. He brings the Order Sentinel, which we saw from the Baratheon Sentinel, so we don't need to cover that. He brings the innate ability Solo Rider, which is similar to the cavalry ability, but it's a little bit different. Solo Rider is very cool. He has three wounds. At the start of his activation, he may perform one maneuver or retreat action. This is a very key thing to remember for you guys just getting into this game. If he is engaged, he may start his activation with a free retreat. With that, you can either charge right back into the melee to get those charge bonus rerolls, or if you roll well for your retreat distance, you can totally turn around rear charge or flank charge an unsuspecting enemy because they thought that your Dragonstone Noble was tied down and he is in fact not adhering to the general rules of combat. Uh, he And then the Noble's Wrath, his ability on his attack, brings Sundering all the time. He then deals plus two automatic hits for each wound, it, each wound he has suffered. I love this guy. Again, he is super, super strong. I think the key to getting this guy going is wounding him on your own terms, being able to do those seven sundering hits, getting into flanks, getting into rears, or otherwise just totally freezing a battle line because of his sentinel ability. They cannot afford to take that free charge with the potential seven sundering hits. What do you make of this guy? Do you love him as much as me, or am I just crazy? Well, I have a love hate relationship with Dragon's Noble because, first of all, model is amazing very tanky guy on a very very tanky horse <laughs> uh, but as you mentioned uh, he has only three wounds so if enemy have some luck or you have bad rolls or you stomp against the precision uh, he can just die very fast but if enemy does, does not have anything like sun, uh, sundering in the flank or precision keywords, that unit can be a really roadblock that, uh, that the enemy cannot go through. And that unit is small, you can just put uh, him in a place and block a lot of battlefield. Uh, but as you said, he has only three wounds. You can do some damage to, to him through stunning stuff like Melisandre and you, for example, and then so, do some massive damage. But then this unit become, uh, becomes really class cannon, uh, roaming around the battlefield with one wound, uh, three dice, and four auto hits with Sundering. And that's maybe that is why I absolutely love it. I love to live on the edge. And I just relish, <laughs> I relish those games where my one Dragonstone Noble just goes full Assassin's Creed and is just absolutely train wrecking <laughs> an entire army by himself. He is still getting two thumbs up from me. Uh, solos are always welcome. And in particular, as you mentioned, if your opponent does not have Sundering with access to vulnerable tokens or other ways of dealing with his two plus three plus, he is going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, I'm looking at units in particular like the Lannister Guardsmen. Getting one Dragonstone Noble into a unit of Lannister Guardsmen, I would like to think they will be swinging at him until they die because they will never get through him. And that's true. That's true. 
and we are ready to move on to some attachments. And we can begin with the shared attachments that would be available for the Stannis side and the Rinley side. There are oddly only two of them. Uh, it's a very... That's, that's interesting that all of these attachments available to them end up being split. But let's start with the first attachment that is available to Renly side and Stannis side. That is the Master Warden. This guy brings the ability Hold the Line. When this unit activates, target one enemy engaged with this unit. It suffers two hits, plus one hit for each of this unit's remaining ranks. Now, when you're playing a defensive faction like Baratheons, it's probably a pretty good chance that when you activate, you are at full ranks, even if you've been attacked. Um, particularly if he's in a unit of Wardens or any Stag Knights or something like that. Uh, how do you feel about the Master Warden? To be honest, I was very excite excited when uh, developers changed Master Warden from a previous, previous ability to the whole line. And I was, uh, to be honest, a real, real prophet, prophet about the new whole line. And I was using Master Warden a lot. And in the first months of uh, season one, Master, Master Warden was great. But later, people just learned to not, not engage the enemy, uh, the unit with Master Warden. So it became a little hard to pull his ability. I think that he still has play, but you have to just create eight act uh, activation list and just keep him as last activation unit with Master Warden. Uh, last, uh, with last activation, you just charge. And in the next round, when you are first player, you just activate this unit, pop hold the line, and attack. And that can be a value. Absolutely. I think it's I think it's undeniable that hold the line is a great ability. We see it a lot from the thins on the free folk side, but that's an ability that they don't necessarily have to pay for outside of the unit cost. And the thin warriors are already a great unit. It can be difficult to squeeze him into those lists when he costs a point. But I will not deny that hold the line is a phenomenal ability. So based on that alone, this guy gets a thumbs up for me. I quite like him. I'd like to see him a little bit more, just not when you're playing my poor low defense Night's Watch guys. <laughs> so moving on to the next attachment and this guy is an absolute bruiser on paper he's potentially one of the best two-point attachments in the game he brings so much to the unit that he goes in uh, we're looking at the stag knight noble this guy's coming in at two points i think i forgot to mention the master warden is one point uh the stag knight noble is coming in at two points he brings go down fighting each time a rank in this unit is destroyed one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound Iron Resolve. This unit gains plus one to panic test rolls and suffers minus one wound from failing panic tests. Stubborn Tenacity. Each time this unit passes a panic test, one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound. That is a lot of defense and retribution all going into one attachment. He's bolstering that panic damage. He's giving you passive wounds as you lose ranks. He's giving you a passive wound for passing a morale test. Now, I know some combinations with this guy. I will let you take it because you are the faction expert. We're probably thinking of the exact same unit together with the same synergies going on. This guy can get insane if your opponent does not know how to deal with this combination. I will let you take it. Okay, thank you, Brad. The combination that I see and I recommend it's putting the Stark Knight Noble into Roll Faithfuls because, come on, they have four, 5 plus armor and 4 plus morale. And with this unit, you create a monster that enemy will be afraid of attacking because if they attack, they will get so much wounds and hits from retribution that is just insane. Like wound from passing the panic test, wound from losing the rank, wounds before the uh, sorry hits before the attack from faithful's ability. That is just insane, and I know that people are praying. Playing rightful here, uh, sorry, not rightful here, faithfuls with uh, Stagnite Noble, and they also take Celis and Sharin NCU just to boss this, uh, boost up this ability, uh, Stubborn Tenacity, to heal uh, two wounds every time they pass a panic test. I absolutely agree. I absolutely 
know from experience what a monster of a unit those Relore Faithful with the Stagnite Noble can be when it's paired with the Selyse and Shireen and with any level of archers that we can fire into that melee. What a scary unit to be engaged with. Absolutely love it. What a bruiser this guy is for two points. So we will now move on to the Stannis side. Initially, we're looking at the Red Priestess. She comes in at one point. She brings Divine Sacrifices. Each time this unit attacks before rolling attack dice, it may suffer up to two wounds. If it does, for each wound suffered, the defender becomes panicked or vulnerable. Um, so you're able to take one wound to place one two token, or you take two wounds to place both. That works for ranged and melee attacks. And on top of that, what a beautiful model she is. Uh, what do you make of our lovely Red Priestess here? I probably... Uh talking about this too much, but models, model of Red Priest is fantastic. Very thematic, very climatic. I like it. And about the ability, uh, this is a very thematic ability for roll side, because you sacrifice an wound to make an uh, enemy uh, uh, to take it. So enemy have to take the token. So you can push, push more wounds while attacking, and I think that the greatest uh, place you can put Red Priest is Lightbringers, because this unit works on range attack, but before the attack you just take two models, and then you become vulnerable at panic, and after you shoot, you force an enemy to reroll the defense dice, then you force an enemy to reroll the panic uh, dice if they directly uh, passes them with Vicious. And if they fail, you can just pick another unit in short range and force that panic test from Lightbringer's ability. And this is just nuts. And to be honest, you can use Red Priest like seven times before you lose uh, the offensive power in Lightbringer's because they have seven, six, four uh, attack dice value. So it's just nice absolutely she's looking phenomenal um it can be difficult to squeeze attachments in but she is certainly an attachment i do not like to see and again in all of these reviews you cannot overlook the value that she brings to those secret missions essentially being able to guarantee that you get those points from that mission where you can expend two tokens is always something that's worth considering but she pairs so well with those uh Stand aside panic shenanigans. I absolutely think she's great and she deserves a look if you have overlooked her. Uh, we will move on now to the one point Dragonstone Noble Attachment. He brings the Order Sentinel, which we have covered in the Sentinels. I uh, he's not he's not bad. Um I've seen him used pretty well in Champions of the Stag, Flayed Men, and even Hedge Knights for an eight point unit that threatens to charge you in the flank if you charge one of those other units. Um, but with the arrival of the Glory Seeker, he was already not super common. The Glory Seeker is just so good. I think it pushes this guy even further down on your list of things that you want to run. But I definitely don't think he's bad. What do you make of the Dragonstone attachment bringing Sentinel? To be honest, Brett, I don't use him because if I have an idea for a list, I probably use just two Dragonstone Nobles as a unit. And I think paying the 1.4 Sentinel, it's uh, not optimal. But as you as you said, uh, some people using them with Hedge Knights, Flight Man, and this is very unit. This is uh, very costly unit but carry yeah they're it's it's interesting for them um I, I definitely don't think they're bad let us know if you've got a really cool list that's using the dragonstone noble attachment and how are you getting use out of sentinel what unit are you putting it in uh, maybe it's even Zorse Riders and you're able to use Sentinel to get those Zorse Riders into the flank. Let us know if you're having any luck with him. And we will now start moving on to the named attachments. We're looking at Davos Seaworth, the Onion Knight. Davos brings the Order Supply Aid. This unit suffers up to three wounds. Restore one plus that many wounds to one 
and other friendly unit in long range. He also brings true conviction. If this is if this unit is a Baratheon unit, each time it attacks an enemy with more remaining ranks, it may reroll any attack dice. This works for the ranged and melee attack. I will let you take off with Davos. I know exactly what unit you're placing him in. I have faced it, and what a unit that becomes. Uh, tell us about Davos. I love Davos. I think uh, he is one of the greatest attachments in Baratheon, and definitely top three in the game because he brings to play eight and also true conviction. And this is a fantastic combo because when you lose ranks from killing other units, you uh, gain the rerolls. And the top one unit you can put Davos in is Lightbringers because Lightbringers stay behind, stay uh, safe. So you can just uh, use uh, Supply 8 to take up to three wounds from Lightbringers and heal four units of your front li liners. And when you lose ranks, you can prob you probably gain rerolls. And as we know, Lightbringers have six dice on second round rank, and with this uh, with rerolls, it just almost uh, six hits every time you shoot an enemy. The second unit that Davos is great in it's Torquos Mercenaries because it's basically five point unit that hold objective and heal others, and the third unit that. I would put Davos is just Wardens, because Wardens are hard to kill. They usually cover the objective. And with Davos, you can take up to three Wardens and heal four uh, wounds elsewhere. And you don't cry about it, because, as I said, Wardens have three plus armor and six plus morale, so it's really, really hard to kill them even if you take the uh, take the wounds from them to other units. Absolutely. I, everything that you said, I've faced those Lightbringers with the rerolls. What a devastating unit they become as they start to get wounded. And being able to supply aid to your units like Champions of the Stag or your other heavy hitters of the army, standing back safely behind them and still able to contribute to the fight. Uh, Davos is just phenomenal in all of the spots that you mentioned. He's the attachment on the Stannis side that I hate to see across the table, and I see him a lot because I think a lot of people agree with his value. Uh, so we will move on to another Seaworth. We're looking at Devon Seaworth, the King's Squire. He is also one point. I don't know if I mentioned Davos was one point. If I didn't, he's one point. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Devon is one point. He is bringing the order Reckless Heroism. When this unit performs a charge action before resolving that action, this unit suffers D3 wounds, but counts as rolling a 6 on all charge distance dice. Then he also brings True Conviction exactly the same as Davos. So, adding a unit to the Baratheons, who tend to be a little bit slow, that can guarantee a 6-inch charge, it seems pretty good to me. Initially, I had thought about putting him in Bastards Girls, that is an 8-point unit. And that idea kind of dissipated, not because I thought it was a bad idea, but that's more of a Bastard's Girl's problem in a hidden trap in auto-hit meta. How do you make, uh, what do you make of Devon? Do you think that he has a place? Uh, to be honest, in the competitive list, I wouldn't take him because you lose uh, wounds and in the competitive stand, you always want to put the most efficient attachments, but I think he has a place. Uh, there are two units that will really benefit from his abilities. First unit I recommend putting Devon in is uh, Roll Faithfuls. And that's a great combination because uh, now you have unit that uh, is real is real threat in 11 inches. And also, you don't care about losing the wounds in the unit because they are already paper. Ar uh, they ha are, have already paper armor. Armor, and also, when you lose wounds, you kick off the other ability, the right, uh, the faithful's ability. And as we know, faithful's ability will make uh, enemies suffer hits every time they attack you. So you can just charge, take wounds. If if you drop a rank, 
that's fine because now your second ability is uh, powered up. Also, true conviction is powered up. If you attack an enemy with more ranks and you lost some wounds due to the reckless heroin, you can just charge over the terrain that takes away the rerolls and still have the rerolls. And the second unit is just a unit of Kingsman because it's another unit that uh, is a real threat in 11 inches. And you get rerolls when you uh, lose a rank. And that can be a real uh, Carecrow for, for enemies. Coming closer than 12 inches. Yep, absolutely. So tell us in the comments where you're sticking Dale and if you've gotten any, or excuse me, where you're sticking Devin and if you've gotten any real use out of him adding that threat range to the Baratheons, which they don't necessarily have because they tend to be a little bit on the slow side. So we are on to the final Seaworth, Dale Seaworth, Captain of the Wrath. He has the ability innately Davos's vassal and he brings Counter-Strike exactly the same as Warden's. And he is one point, and additionally, I don't know if anyone's ever pointed this out. I think he looks like Mickey. I think he looks like Mickey Maserat. <laughs> like just, <laughs> just maybe just a little bit. He looks a little bit like Mickey, which is always a plus. Yeah, just uh, Mickey Seawolf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start calling him that. He's going to have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love the model, but the Davos have one problem. Davos Commander have one problem, and you probably want to use Dale Seaworth with Davos Commander, because Dale Seaworth have Davos Vassal ability. And the problem with Davos is that that his NCU version and his attachment version are just over the top. They are great in every way. And if you have uh, the opportunity to pick commander, you will probably never never take Davos because you have in mind that his NCU brings so much value while charging, and if you don't have a place for Davos NCU, you will probably take him as a attachment to get supply aid, and that's why I thing that the Mickey have fine model, <laughs> but we will never see him. Fair enough. So let us know if you stand behind Shevster on that and or if you are getting some value out of Dale. So we will now move on to Andrew Estamont, true loyalist. He comes in at one point. He brings the order in sight. When this unit is performing a melee attack before rolling attack dice, this attack gains vicious and rolls its highest attack die value. That pairs pretty well with True Conviction, being able to reroll when you're down rank, so you would have your maximum attack dice, and most likely you would have rerolls plus the Vicious. It seems like a pretty nice combo to me. I've never seen him used. We know that attachments are difficult um, because there's so many of them, particularly on the Baratheon side. Uh, what do you make of Andrew? Is he possibly being slept on? Is that combination worth bringing? Uh, I think that the Order, Insight, and True Conviction are great together. That's a very fine catch-up mechanism in this game. But as you said, putting attachments in this game is really difficult. You always want to maximize your efficient uh, efficiency with your list. And to be honest, I used him once. Uh, just to just for fun in casual game uh, I think that the order insight is just not enough to put him in the list but maybe I'm wrong maybe someone will point in comments some combination that I slept on and the combination will just break my word <laughs> I hope so <laughs> absolutely so moving on to from Andrew, we are on to Brian Faring. He also comes in at one point. It's just another situation where I see so much value out of these out of this guy. I've never seen him play, but I, it's just such a good ability. Uh, protection of the crown. While you control the crown, each time this unit is attacked, it may reroll any defense dice. We've seen this on the Lannister side for 
a little while with Aris Oakhart. Um, it's Aris Oakhart, I think. Wow, look at me. My knowledge is slipping. Punish me in the comments if I got it wrong. I'm pretty sure it's Aris Oakhart that has this ability. Uh, Brian Faring additionally brings true conviction. <sighs> Tell me about it. I mean, it just seems so good on paper for one point. Uh, what what do you make of him? Why, why aren't we seeing him a little bit more often? That's a lot of attachments with true conviction, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Well, I think that Brian is very interesting uh, attachment for one point. Uh, the protection of the crown is very good ability, especially in army that have units with three plus armor, and uh, basically making them unkillable. And I really like Brian firing into in the Lightbringers with Massey Commander because Massey have uh, cards to pop the True Conviction ability and as we Baratheons we love to have crown so his protection of the crown ability is always probably always on and being able to reroll defense dice and that uh, the reroll is after enemy spends for the blue token that is just amazing and I recommend him using him Lightbringers he will always win the range duel with another range unit and also I think that he has place in the Kingsman uh, because Kingsman have 4 plus armor and being able to reroll defense dice will really help them stay on the battlefield longer and wreck havoc. Wow that's really nice insight that's two really great units as a home for him um yeah and i completely agree with both of the points that you've made so uh let us know in the comments again if you agree with chevster on this guy i've personally never seen him but i really like your analysis and the recommended units moving on to a bit more expensive attachment we are now looking at axel florent fanatical devotee he has two points he brings innately the relore affiliation he also brings innately the melee attack ability, Zealous Fanaticism. This unit's melee attacks gain Vicious and always roll their highest attack die value. This is similar to Insight, except for it's not in order. It would be with every attack. And it has the caveat of this unit suffers one wound for each attack die roll of one. He also brings Intimidating Presence. Enemies engaged with this unit suffer minus one to morale test rolls and plus one wound from failing panic tests. So... My only issue with this guy is that in the two-point attachment slot, in particular, things are really crowded because for me, you are always competing with Reek and Ramsey. In my humble opinion, for two points, no matter what faction you're playing, if you're spending two points on an attachment, it is hard to ever do better than Reek and Ramsey. Additionally, he is competing with that Stag Knight Noble who we just discussed, who is just a powerhouse unit at two points. I think those two things combined are making Axel not see play. However, he's in a really weird spot because if he was one point, I think he would maybe be auto-include, but maybe not. We're not going to speculate and, and wish list on this podcast. Just tell me what you think about him and have you ever used him? Where have you used him? Oh, to be honest, Brett, I never used Axel Commander, uh, Axel Attachments because, as you said, I think that Ramsey for two points is better, and also it's really hard to squeeze this point attachment in army because uh, Baratheons have really small amount of units that cost four point. It's only Dragonstone Noble unit, uh, and I think that. There could be possibility of this unit, this attachment combining with some Wardens maybe and Lightbringers and that Lightbringers would, would just shot the unit engaged with Wardens with Axel attachment but it's really cost pricey combination so I don't know I don't see him. I tend to agree and it's not very often for me to take that stance but I I would really struggle to see him being added to a list for the reasons that we mentioned. Um, and finally, moving on to Justin Massey at two points, another two pointer. And you could, depending on what list you're running, you could make a case for also running him above 
Axel if you're bringing a two-point attachment. He brings the order battle plan, start of any turn. Discard two tactics cards to search your tactics deck for any one card and add it to your hand. Shuffle your tactics deck. The order threaten when this unit activates, target one enemy in long range, they become weakened. So on paper, I think threaten is really nice for Baratheons because the name of their game is survival. They love getting those counter strikes from those wardens. It works so well with weakened tokens. So threaten seems like a pretty strong ability. I know that battle plan is a difficult one because you have to discard two cards. I think the Baratheon deck is fairly solid. We'll cover that when we do the deck overview. But in particular, if you are running Stannis, the rightful heir, I think you give consideration to him simply because that Stannis battle plan can live and die by whether you get tactical approach or not. Uh, how do you think uh, Justin Massey fits in? Do you see him anywhere besides Stannis? Oh, that's a good question, to be honest. I think that Massey brings the biggest value with Rightful here. And to be honest, with only him, because as we know, the Rightful here have great cards that you want from the round one. Uh, uh, I never used him with another commander because, as you said, Baratheon deck is very good and you don't want to lose parts. Uh, so he just brings the best value in Annie's rightful here list. And I saw people using him uh, with Tom Pro mercenaries because now he co uh, cost one point less. But also, I heard that people are using him, him with Wardens because the, uh, the weekend token really work with the Counter-Strike. And that's it. That's two good spots that are two. And he's, uh, he's just amazing with Torko Mercenaries and Wardens, so you don't have to find another place for him. Yeah, I, I think I tend to agree. Uh, I think there's better attachments that you could put in the Lightbringers. You can make a case for putting him there. Additionally, to help out with that Archer on Archer combat, but I think we've covered that there are better attachments for those Lightbringers. He just seems to be in a little bit of a difficult place, but being able to go get that Commander card when you want it is definitely potent, so it's something that you should consider, particularly if you've lost a game because you did not get Tactical Approach when you needed it. Um, that is the end of the Stannis side attachments. And now we're going to take a look at the Stannis side commander attachments and what their attachments bring to the table. We will not be looking at the specific tactics cards and what they add to the equation because we have for you a breakdown coming that will analyze the tactics deck and each commander's unique cards and how they fit into the army. So for today, uh, Shadster, we're just going to focus on what the attachments abilities bring. So we're starting first with starter box Stannis. The rightful heir. The reason that a number of people play Baratheons is this guy right here. Uh, so let's go into him. I think he is phenomenal. We start with the order adaptive planning. Start of any turn, target one combat unit in long range. Replace one condition token on that unit with any other condition token. He has the ability mark target. Start of a friendly turn, target one enemy in line of sight and long range. They become vulnerable. Then of course he brings loyalty to Stannis Baratheon. What do you make of the Rightful Heir? I know that he is one that you absolutely love. So what is he bringing to the party um, with his just with his attachment? Yeah, you're right. I absolutely love him. I think that's it. He's number one uh, Baratheon commanders. He's very powerful. And you're going to notice this when we will talk about the cards. But with his attachment, he brings absolute great value with token play. As you know, Baratheons can... Uh, can go into the tokens very very well throwing token left and right and this guys with his order mark target uh, he basically puts six uh, six vulnerable tokens over the game and that's a very good very good ability as you know uh, the vulnerable token can push the damage can change the great defensive role, role into the bad one for the enemy and uh, adaptive planning the ability to change one order into another uh, it's great it's really really great because 
first of all, you can change this vulnerable token you just put into the weekend token. And enemy that want to attack wardens will think twice because, as you know, uh, wardens have counter strike uh, and attacking unit with counter strike when you have a weekend token on yourself it's very bad move and also you have to remember that you can use adaptive plank on your unit that have two or more tokens and change one token into the another and by this action the uh, new token w will not be placed on that unit because unit can't have uh, two same tokens on themselves so basically adaptive playing can be used for changing one token to another when you want to attack or removing the tokens from your units yeah i think he's phenomenal i think again tokens are one of the most powerful tools in this game he is just a juggernaut at churning out tokens um and i think he's great i think he's He's just really strong, and I, I guess we'll get more into that when we get into his commander cards. I very much uh, fear him. But moving on, we are going to look at the next Stannis Baratheon. This is the One True King. Uh, he brings the affiliation Relore that is an innate ability. It can never be shut off. He also brings Dauntless. Each time this unit passes a morale test, it restores one wound. He brings Iron Resolve. This unit gains plus one to panic test rolls and suffers minus one wound from failing panic tests. And of course, again, he's loyalty Stannis Baratheon. Um, that synergy is very obvious, Dauntless and Iron Resolve, but uh, break it down for me a little bit more. Where does the, the One True King fit? Well, One True King fit very well in Wardens, making them 3 plus armor, 5 plus uh, moral, the, uh, moral unit. It's That is really, really hard to kill because every time they pass a panic test, they heal but his true place and he always should be put in Queensman because one true king in, Queens in Queensman it's the most defensive combo you can make in this game that's 3 plus uh, armor unit with 4 plus moral uh, unit taking one less damage if they fail panic test which is almost impossible and also, every time they uh, pass the panic test, they heal. Uh, so they almost unkillable. And even if someone managed to bring uh, Queensman to almost death situation, you can use the to the last token test, uh, pass the panic test because it's easy with five plus morale. And then you stay on one health, and then you heal one from Dauntless. One true king just change, changes the Queensman into the most tanky unit and to be honest you should never go and try to take down the Queensman with one true king because it's almost impossible or it's possible but you have put a lot of resources and even if you put uh, this this much resources into killing them it's not worth it it's just not worth it yeah and that that sounds about like about as fun as beating my head on a concrete wall and that's probably realistically what it feels like trying to bring that unit down um moving on we are into the final version of stannis so far now the the design space open for a fourth stannis but we're looking at stannis baratheon the king at the wall this is a mounted commander attachment he brings the Order Insight. When this unit is performing a melee attack before rolling attack dice, this unit gains Vicious and rolls its highest attack die value. He also brings Stubborn Tenacity. Each time this unit passes a panic test, one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound. He looks like an absolute nightmare in Champions of the Stack. So take it off. Have you given this guy a try? Did he turn into the you know, thing that everybody feared. I think when he was kind of previewed, everyone was super, super, super worried about him. Has he lived up to the hype or is he just... Uh, I think that people hyped him too much and when uh, they saw the card from the box, they were a little disappointed that he brings only uh, Stubborn Tenacity and Order Insight. Uh, they all uh, thought that he would bring some uh, token play, maybe, as you know, as Stannis rightful here, 
but I think that that's good pair of abilities. One is defensive, another one is offensive. And as you know, with uh, putting him in the Tempest of the Stark, uh, there is a great chance that you will pop this Taborn Tenacity one wound uh, with with this cavalry because they are very tanky and every time uh, someone attacks them it's very high chance to do zero wounds and that's mean uh, auto passing the panic test and this vicious changes the chances of the stack to little flight man with uh, vulnerable token critical blow vicious i think that this combination can do and push uh, a lot of damage. Yep, I agree. Um, I think he's still, I think he's still really, really strong. I think you mentioned that some people might have been a little bit disappointed. I think he's definitely worth giving a go, and he might be one of these pieces that kind of comes around full circle. Uh, we've seen that happen before, and it, it certainly could be the case with him, where there's a meta shift and. You know, Champions of the Stag are already very good, but you could see some type of meta shift that makes Heavy Cavalry even more attractive, at which point his stock goes up. That is kind of that is kind of the way that this game works, right? Some things that weren't good before, it doesn't take much, and then they're good again. So let's see what the future has in store for Stannis. I still fear him. I still think he has a place in the meta. I think he's definitely very strong, so we'll have to see if that comes to be. Uh, let me know in the comments if you... Uh, agree with my take on it that he's that he's very very good or if you're with Shevster and you think he's just kind of a little bit overhyped uh, the Stannis controversy hashtag here we go <laughs> um, moving on moving on to the first non Stannis Stannis side commander we're looking at Davos Seaworth he is the hero of Blackwater he brings the ability outflank you may hold this unit off the table in reserve instead of deploying it at the start of any round if you are not the first player, you may place one unit from reserve fully within short range of a friendly of a friendly or flank table edge unactivated. He also brings Pathfinder. This unit ignores the dangerous, hindering, and rough keywords. So for me, when I initially saw him, this is even when Outflank wasn't buffed to the point that it is now. He kind of screamed out to Bastards Girls for me. Uh, Bastards Girls are in a very difficult spot in the meta. Um, they are just absolutely destroyed by hidden traps. So much so that I just think they've they've disappeared from the meta. They're just not even worth taking. With that said, I still think him in a D Davos in a unit of Lightbringers could be super super scary. You're bringing them on in the flank or the rear of that enemy. That is not where you want Lightbringers. Uh, what do you make of him? Is it anything that's worth worth doing? Is it worth doing? Is it worth trying that? Or is that just kind of like a meme -y, hey, it'll work every once in a while, but it's not reliable. Tell us about Davos. Okay, I uh, tend to agree with the second option. It's kind of a meme guy because he he brings bring Outflank and Pathfinder. So when you play in casual games, when you just pick terrains or when you play in a tournament where you can just pick terrains, you can do some funny stuff like play, placing stakes uh, on the, uh, near the board, like six inches from the uh, battlefield, when the battlefield ends. And with uh, bringing the doubles on this side, protected by the stakes, <laughs> uh, shooting with light bringers. But uh, I don't see a place with him uh, on, uh, as a commander on the competitive scene because uh, he suffers from two things. First, his NCU version is just amazing, and I would rate Davos uh, A, plus, to be honest. And also, the second thing, uh, the Davos attachment is just over the top, and I would rate this attachment S like super and yeah i don't see a place for davos as a commander when we have two super powerful options with nco and attachment versions yeah and i think i think that's probably the biggest hiccup um that and the fact that he drops final strike are going to be the two biggest hindrances for his commander to really shine um 
I think he's cool. I think he brings some things that, that can be helpful, but those two points, it's really, really difficult to get over, and I think that's probably the reason he just doesn't really see the table. Um, moving on to the next Stannis side commander, we have Andrew Estermont. He brings true conviction. If this unit is a Baratheon unit, each time it attacks an enemy with more remaining ranks, it may reroll any attack dice. First of the King's Men, you count as controlling the crown and letter zones for tactics cards that target this unit. What do you make of Andrew Estermont? I know we're not going into his tactics cards, but he is a super aggressive commander. Uh, what do you make of him? Does he fall into the trap of the rest of the aggressive commanders? I think yes. He is uh, also a trap. I, I know that new players really like to take him and try him because he looks very scary, especially in the Kingsman. Uh, that's his native unit because you can uh, every time you attack, you just take uh, the out of uh, always the fury from the discard pile or, or from the deck and play it with all the bonuses. Uh, that's the fine ability with the uh, named first of the king's man. Also, he has nice ability true conviction, which is catch up mechanism. Uh, but we will just. When we will talk about the cards, you will see that uh, he is very aggressive and sometimes maybe too aggressive and uh, that abilities won't uh, help him survive on the battlefield. I do think that Andrew is pretty good. Um, it's just there just seems to be an issue in this game with aggressive commanders overall. They tend not to be the best choice. I think the one exception might be Jon Snow, but it's difficult to name Jon Snow an aggressive commander. That's just what he's used for. I think ideally for the developers, they would say that Othel and they would say that Othel and Cotter Pike are the Night's Watch aggressive commanders. But yeah, you see it pretty well across the board. Gregor Kildane, um, Great John Umber might be another exception. He's doing pretty well for the Starks right now. Um, but I think Starks just in general are aggressive. So. Um, for the most part, that one standout aggressive commander just doesn't seem to be shining in the meta as we would like them to. But we shall see what the game developers do. <laughs> I think they want us to be aggressive, Shevster. They want to see us <laughs> kill each other. They're sick and tired of all this retreating and, and playing on tokens. They want to see blood and fire. Uh, and mentioning fire, we're moving on to my absolute favorite Baratheon commander, uh... I have a love-hate relationship with this guy because I really love playing him. I think he's underrated. I hate playing against him because the tricks that I love using, they always seem to get me as well. We are talking about Axel Florent, first of the King's Men. Uh, he brings the affiliation Relore. It is an innate ability. Uh, he's bringing Intimidating Presence. Enemies engaged with this unit suffer minus one to morale test rolls and plus one wound from failing panic tests. He also brings Stalwart. This unit gains plus two to morale test rolls. I absolutely love him. He's bringing... Intimidating Presence is such a strong ability, and I would list that as an offensive type of ability. And then he's bringing Stalwart, which is one of the stronger defensive abilities that you can bring. I think this guy is just nasty. Um, I love him. What do you make of him? Oh, I think that you said it all. He's great. He brings both one offensive and one defensive ability, and he can be named, I think, uh, aggressive commander due, he, due, due to his cards, but we will talk about it later. I like him. He has great combo with Conviction. Uh, he has great combo with uh, Lightbringer's unit. Uh, he has great combo with Melisandre and Sue. You just push this panic damage to the top. And also, it's very hard to kill him because uh, he brings a uh, stalwart. So basically, when, he, when we put him in the unit of Queensman, now it's unit 3 plus armor, 3 plus morale. <laughs> and in that case, uh, you have only like 2 and half percent of failing a panic test. So you would have to be very very unlucky to fail a panic test with Axel Commander. Yep, I absolutely agree. Um, it is indeed a stalwart unit with a stalwart attachment. 
uh, pun intended, it is very hard to shift Axel. For the most part, people just try to avoid him altogether because it's just not fun getting stuck in there. Uh, usually he's bringing Lightbringers in the list somewhere. Super, super scary. Um, we will now move on to Justin Masley, the Smiler. This is a guy I think you warmed up to a little bit. I know you've given him a try at least and had a little bit of luck with him. So let's take a look at what he brings to the table. He brings the order tactical reposition, start of an enemy turn, target one friendly unit in short range. They perform a three inch shift. Uh, he brings inspiring present. This this unit's morale stat becomes five plus. Um, I think bringing tactical reposition to Baratheons is a most welcome thing. He's not the only instance of it, but I think with everything else that he has going on and the fact that he unlocks those sexy, sexy Lightbringers by being a Stannis guy, they will certainly appreciate that three inch shift when it comes to the archer on archer battle in particular. What kind of luck did you have with Justin Massey? I know you tried him out a little bit because uh, Mikkel told me <laughs> about the list he <laughs> ran and he did, he did not think it was funny. Okay, <laughs> thanks Miguel. I, to be honest, I very like Massey. I think that uh, he's my third uh, Stannis commander. Uh, the tactical reposition is just blessing with the Baratheons, because all the Baratheons always move very, very slow, and that bridge shift really can do miracles. Uh, I like to put him in Wardens, because uh, now it's very good uh, tank unit, 3 plus armor, 5 plus morale. I like to put him with Lightbringers, because now it's 4 plus and 5 plus, uh, 4 plus armor, 5 plus morale unit, and you can put him a little behind your other units and uh, have access to everyone uh, in 6 inches to pop this tactical position every time you need. And I think that it's the the best commander to try double Lightbringers list, especially thanks to the tactical reposition because with that you can do some great shenanigans on the battlefield, and also he has very very nice cards that can help add some survival survivability to your frontliners and keep your units unengaged. Uh, especially your ranged unit. I recommend using him at, or at least trying to play with him and you will see how much fun he can be. Absolutely. I think he's definitely worth giving a shake if you haven't already. And so that will be the last of the Stannis side commanders. Uh, we are going to start on NCUs with the two NCUs that are available to both sides. Uh, we'll start with Alistair Florent. He is uh, Lord of Brightwater. He has four points and we are bringing Shifting Loyalties. Alistair begins the game with three order tokens on him. Each time Alistair claims a zone, after resolving that zone's effect, you may remove one order token from him. If you do, move him to an empty zone or switch zones with any other NCU. At first glance, it doesn't seem bad. There's some synergies that you can do. There's some cool things that you can do with this. Um, unfortunately, in the last version, when it came to secret missions, it mattered which zone you controlled at the end of the round. It wasn't about which zone you claimed. They did change that, but previously Alistair was the master of those those missions because they were worth a substantial amount of points, and Alistair could just guarantee you those points by switching the zone out, and now he controls it, and there wasn't really a whole lot you could do about it. Moving forward into this version of the game, it matters which zone you claim at the point where you claim it, so he's not quite as good as he was before. Um, that said, he can still be used to block those zones. Uh, your opponent wouldn't give you a point. You wouldn't give up a point, but you would take that zone kind of out of the game. What do you make of Alistair? He seems, he seems okay. Uh, he seems okay, but in world where we have Peter Baelish for four points, I don't see a place for Alistair because Peter does exactly what Alistair do, but with additional ability once per game. Uh, you can uh, try to use him uh, when playing against the Martels uh, and when Martels uh, bring the Water Garden. So you can uh, assure to get Water Gar Garden every turn 
and that means you will be blocking enemy from using the additional ab abilities from cars or uh, from Alaria, for example. But I don't think that is worth taking, and that's that's a sad thing because uh, I think that uh, action uh, NCOs should be always better than neutral ones. All right, and we're moving on to the second one. Shira Errol, Lady of Haystack Hall. She brings support of Haystack Hall. Each time Shira claims the crown, restore one wound to one friendly combat unit. Each time Shira claims the letter, remove one condition token from one friendly combat unit. Each time Shira claims the wealth zone, if you remove a con condition token, place one condition token of that type on one enemy combat. And again, she just doesn't seem bad. We know how powerful restoring wounds are in the game, so just kind of plunking a wound in there off of the crown is certainly not bad. Um, being able to remove a condition token when you claim the letters is pretty solid. The bags, the wealth zone, it's, I mean, it's okay when it works, but I think, again, we're just in this situation where she's, she's just okay, she's not bad. So for me, I, I've seen her used a couple of times, um, particularly to kind of double down on the healing on those champions of Stag. Other than that, I just don't see a whole lot of her. What do you make of Shira? I think that Shira has a play. Maybe she's not the best, but in some list you can... Uh, she's even mandatory, I think. And I think that she works very, very, very well with Riders of High Garden because uh, Shira will keep them clean from the tokens. And as we know, Riders of High Garden uh, have great uh, charge, you know, the lance abilities. So they throw like 10 dice with Sundering, but they throw it on 4 plus. And that weekend token can really mess that up. So Shira keeps you, uh, keeps your unit. Uh, Clean, and that's a good thing because she takes down the token from the letter zone, which is nice because now you just uh, cleared your unit from token. Uh, you put uh, some token on an enemy. You draw two cards. You so you basically didn't lose tempo by taking the bugs and um, putting yourself on the risk for reapplying the token with letter zone. And I would just focus mainly on these two zones, so bags and letters, because the crown zone, the hill, it's uh, it's okay, but I think that the crown zone is one of the weakest zones in this game, or a faction where you cannot just push the uh, panic damage from the cards or abilities. So basically, you will probably just use Peter uh, to put him on the crown and use some other zone just to pop the abilities from the card to make your card stronger and then Sh Shira will take another zone and yeah so to, to to sum it up I think that he has play in some list but if you don't uh, take Riders of High Garden or even High Garden Pikeman into your list then you don't have to take her all right, fair enough. So now we're moving on to the loyalty-specific NCUs, and we're starting with what a lot of people view as the Baratheon NCU. She's kind of labeled as a negative play experience. I quite like her. I think she brings a lot of synergy. I think she's important, in particular, for those Axel lists that I mentioned. I absolutely love the combination of Melisandre and Axel. That said, we are looking at Melisandre, of course, the Red Woman. Sacrifice to the Lord of Light. Influence. When this unit claims his own, attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round. When Melisandre influences a friendly unit, you may have them suffer two wounds and one panic test. If you do, target one enemy combat unit. That enemy suffers one panic test with minus two to their roll and plus two wounds on failure. While influencing a friendly unit, that unit is a relore unit, and its melee attacks gain Vicious. There's a lot to unpack there. The most important thing to unpack is that she is an influence, so she can be copied, basically duplicated, by Jacquin, follower of the Red God, and that is probably where some people think that she gets to the point where she's kind of broken, maybe? Uh, they call it the double Melisandre, or the burn list, or the double burn list, however you want to word it. 
the Mel Bomb. It is absolutely nasty. It can get nasty. It's a little bit dicey, but it is a thing that is a valid strategy. What do you make of Melisandre? Oh, I think that it's uh, Melisandre is a great NCO, uh, and that's how five point point NCO should look like, bringing uh, the great ability to your army. Okay, I understand that uh, Melisandre can be negative player can bring negative player experience, especially when combined with Daken. But also, people have to remember that you can counter it by having units with good morale or. Uh, Think your units close to the weirwood tree. Also, Melisandre back and combo is called Casino because it's so dicey. It's in some games that combination can win you this game games, but in other games you can just hurt your units more than the uh, you will hurt the enemy. But she has very good play in Baratheons thanks to the one true king commander which brings iron resolve and dauntless so you can combine these two pieces together and you will just take probably one wound from using her and then you will force your enemy to take a panic test with minus two plus two or if you want to be more offensive as you said you can use her with axel just to combine her with his card uh, that make you suffer wounds and as we know that uh, Axel Commander brings intimidating presence. So if you are engaged with enemy unit and you pop the Melisandre on this unit, uh, then this enemy unit just basically ma is making the panic test minus three plus three wounds. And that is just good, good. But there are some games when Melisandre will kill your units. Absolutely. Yeah, I think she's I think she's fine. I think she's an important element in the game. She kind of makes you think twice about running those poor morale armies. I I'm fine with her existence. Um so we will now move on to the next uh Stannis side NCU. We are looking at Axel Florent, Hand of the Queen. He comes in at four points. He brings Enrilor's name, influence, win this unit, claims his own, attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round. While influencing an enemy unit, each time they fail a panic test, they become weakened. While influencing an enemy unit, if they are engaged with a Relore unit, they suffer plus one wound from failing panic tests. This, it seems, I mean, it seems okay. Um, the issue being, he wants to have synergy with himself, his commander version. Um, you want the intimidating presence to add that extra plus one as well. Now, I can see that they're kind of creating a an intimidating presence of sorts with him. And I totally understand where he's going to work. I just think he's maybe a little bit clunky. Um, what do you make of him? Uh, to be honest, I uh, like the Prevorous version more. Uh, okay, new Axel is fine, but uh, it's really reliable on enemy failing a panic test and it's just one enemy so you can uh, put that influence on one enemy and you pray to the gods the red gods uh, so that enemy will fail this panic test to get the weekend token so sometimes the this influence will do nothing and the second part or plus one won't if they engage with roll a unit so basically you have to put uh, that influence on the unit that is engaged to your role Queensman or maybe some your unit that is uh, rolled by one true king affiliation. I think that you have to put a lot of resources to make him work and there are better options uh, built for four points. I think that the Axel can be uh, used in Bargo list. When you put your uh, Vargo commander in the Queensman unit, and uh, that combination can be scary and can do a lot of wounds because Vargo has abilities to push uh, uh, panic with uh, his cards, and also uh, his cards uh, rely on weakened token. So it's very good combo and synergy. 
yeah i think i think there's some synergies there that can be taken advantage of but as you mentioned it can be kind of hard to set up um we tend to lean into things that are really reliable moving on to Celise and shireen the queen and princess they bring fervent conviction influence when this unit claims his own attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round while influencing a unit it gains plus one to morale test rolls and each time it passes a morale test one enemy it is engaged with suffers one wound necessary sacrifices once per game when a friendly combat unit would be destroyed instead that unit is not destroyed and remains in play with the two wounds until the end of the game it is a relore unit don't know if i mentioned it but she has six points uh they i suppose they are six points it's a it's difficult with six point ncus they have to be super super effective i think that they are and could be i just think the issue is in the list building with baratheons because they 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 don't have a lot of flexibility to get to eight activations which seems to be the magic number and certainly not if you bring them i think they can work in a very elite seven activation list i really like them um in particular they obviously have crazy synergy going with the uh the stubborn tenacity ability because this is essentially stubborn tenacity that is not stubborn tenacity so it would stack and you would get you know the she adds the plus one morale which would stack with stalwart iron resolve or anything like that and then additionally when you pass a panic test they would take two wounds um so it's really really good what do you make of them have you managed to find a spot for them they did go from five points to six in this last update they used to die when they use necessary sacrifices they are no longer destroyed so what do you make of them oh the point of case it's really hard to sell uh so this century now because when you when we're paying for six points for an ncu we want him to bring fantastic value to the game, like Tywin and Ciro, right? Or the Hotel. Uh, and Shireen. For 5 points, I would feel her because the Stubborn Tenacity and plus 1 to Moral Test, uh, it's nice. It would have some good uh, synergy with uh, King of the uh, King on the Wall, Commander, or maybe some Axel, uh, Commander, but Currently, I don't see a place uh, for her in roster. Even this uh, second ability that will help you to keep your unit alive on the battlefield, that's not convinc that can't convince me to take her. And I'm a little sad because in previous version, for where she was for five point, she was used. I saw her play a lot. Uh, on many tournaments, but as you know, changing uh, NCU or unit by one point can make this unit completely unassable or completely awesome. Unfortunately, changing the point on Celis and Shrin make her, them, make them completely hard to sell and hard to justify it. Uh, yeah, and I, I, t I tend to agree. And then it's also a matter of, you know, the opportunity cost because the, the Stannis side does have a number of very good and very useful NCUs. Um, obviously, I like Melisandre, and now we're getting ready to get into a few more that I think are just really, really strong. And they bump her out anyway. And then with them being six points, it makes the decision a little bit easier. But let's start with Davos Seaworth, Hand of the True King. So we've already seen him in a couple of forms, and I think maybe Davos' biggest hiccup is that Davos is just good no matter where he is. Davos' NCU is phenomenal. He has four points. He brings Smuggler's Cunning. Davos begins the game with three order tokens on him. Each time a friendly unit charges, after rolling charge distance dice, you may remove one token from Davos. If you do, you may reroll any charge distance dice. Each time a friendly unit activates, you may, re may remove one token from Davos. If you do, until the end of the turn, enemies engaged with that unit may not use orders or be the target of friendly tactics cards. So Davos, right off the, I mean, right off the rip, giving Baratheons rerolls on charge distance is really, really strong because they tend to be a little bit on the slow side, and some of their best units are those infantry units. So being able to just with a stick 
give them those rerolls is really nice. The second part of his ability is so good. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of Martels because a number of the things that they do when you charge in that they want to punish you for are orders and cards. They wouldn't be able to play Dune Tactics. They wouldn't be able to play Set for Charge. They wouldn't be able to use Shield Wall. They wouldn't be able to play Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken to automatically pass. Just so many things that they can't do makes Davos so attractive to me. What do you make of Davos? Uh, I think that you completely covered that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That's the curse of the Davos. His attachment version is fantastic, and now his ver NCU version is great. We get, okay, free uses, free tokens. The usage of the token in the right moment can completely change the uh, outcome of the, your fight. Because, as you mentioned, using uh, the Davos token, when you reunit activate, and keep in mind, you don't have to be engaged to pop this ability. You just activate the unit, pop, uh, take the token, and this unit gains ability that every engaged unit cannot play or can, cannot be targeted by cards or play orders. So you can pop this token and then charge enemy and cannot play cards, cannot use orders, and that kills the mortals. The royal guards are sad because no, no set for charge, no shield wall. That uh, token really hurts the Night Watch because they, now they cannot play the shields or uh, fire that, that burns. So no defensive dice rerolls, no uh, panic rolls. You can use it against Lannister Supremacy, just charge you, the unit with this ability and it's useless, they cannot use it. They cannot play Wealth of the Rock, uh, that's uh, Kevon Lan uh, Lannister. One of the best cards, I think, because it's very, very defensive and help uh, Lannister units to survive the charges. He's great. Uh, having Davos and the tokens that uh, let you reroll the charge dice, uh, that uh, allows to play more aggressively to make longer charges happen because you can always reroll re the bad roll and I don't I cannot count how many times he just saved my ass when I rerolled that one into the four and five and I successfully charged an enemy. Yep, I think he's really good. Um and just as you mentioned, Davos is good all the way down the line. So um, <laughs> and now we're moving on to Crescent. He is the maester at Dragonstone. He's five points. He brings sacrifice for the king. At the start of any round, you may activate Crescent. You may activate Crescent. He is not Crescent. Uh, if you do, destroy Crescent at the end of the round. Loving counsel. Each time Crescent claims the crown, you may replace that zone's effect with... Draw two tactics cards and, and place any one condition token on any combat unit. So essentially what we're seeing here is you can replace the crowns with the effect of the letter. And then his once per game ability doesn't seem like much at first glance, but it is really, really strong. It brings a lot of implications. You're able to steal, you know, the, the coveted combat zone on a round where your opponent was going first. They would not be able to get it and they would have to deal with you doing an out of turn attack. And he's there until the end of the round for whatever that's worth. So you kind of save him for late. Or you can use him when you want to really, really change the battle to your favor. Put the enemy in a position where they just can't come back. What do you make of Crescent? I know you like him a lot. Yes, I like him a lot. And I think he's great. And I think that uh, both Crescent and Patchface from the Hero Box 3 really change the Baratheons as affection because Crescent brought to the Bartheons that what Stannis needed so we can just draw a card from the crown and put a token and that's very uh, synergized very very well with Rightful Here, One True King or even Justin Massey because uh, now we don't have to be dependent on the letters and as we know letters is a very powerful tactic zone so it's usually taken now we can just have the same uh, result from the crown and as you know Baratheon's, uh, uh, Baratheon cards have additional effects when you take the crown so it's just 
good synergy and about the second ability when you can sac uh, sacrifice the crescent for the king uh, basically you can uh, be first player in four out of six rounds and take i don't know even swords uh, out of your turn and keep in mind that the sacrifice uh, for the king it's at start of the round so enemy cannot play any cards like start of the turn because it it happens before anything before any turn so if you want to kill enemy that is on low health or if you want to kill your unit that it's uh, very very wounded you can just pop crescent take the zone and block your enemy from uh, doing uh, much harm and if you want some shenanigans you can always uh, pop crescent at the start of the round when you are the first player and people usually do that when they have brawny light bringers because that will allow you allow you to do two shots before enemy can respond because crescent can go on the swords and attack and then as you are first player you can just activate another unit put this unit on the box and do a second shot and being shot twice by Lightbringer can really hurt you. And the meme stuff, you can always combine Crescent with Fargo Commander and do two attacks at the start of the round with his cards. Yeah, and that... It could be meme but it could also be devastating. Um, I tend to agree with everything that you're saying. I think Crescent is great. I think his sacrifice ability is totally worth it. It's one of the better ones. Um, it's always going to be peer compared to Corrin, but probably not a fair comparison, and Corrin is just so stinking good. Um, Crescent falls in the realm of fair. I quite like him. And we will now move on to the final NCU for the Stannis side. We are looking at Patchface. Patches. Patches brings misunderstood omens. Patchface begins the game with three order tokens on him. At the start of any round, you may spend one order token from him. If you do, you may state the name of a tactics card. If your opponent has one or more tactics cards in their hand with that name, they must discard one tactics card with that name. I love the wording on this card because <laughs> I'm just imagining the, the the beta testing team and Michael and Fabio, they're writing this rule. And, and they say, you know, if your opponent has this tactics card in their hand, they must discard it. And then they're like anticipating, they're saying, well, somebody's going to say that they didn't have one copy of that card they had two copies and that's why they justified not discarding it <laughs> it's just the way i see this wording going they were so careful with the wording on this card to make sure that it works exactly the way that it's supposed to and it does i you know initially i didn't like patch face um as a non baratheon player i thought that he was really strong i think he's fine i think he's cool i like him um I think he's just an interesting element to the game. He's kind of funny. He's a little bit funny, but there's always the chance that he just doesn't work. But that said, he can either be really good or really strong. It's a risk that you're taking. I also view him as a reward. He's a reward for the players who study the game. He's a reward for the players who know a ton about the game because that's where the value is going to come from, knowing what cards to go after and the moments to go after them. So I like Patchface. I will run him. I'm working on a Baratheon army that I'm planning to play a lot more in person with my indie guys. Patchface will be in it. My club will probably hate me. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I like him. Um, where do you stand on Patchface? It's an obvious question. You're very knowledgeable about the game, so I know you love him. I love him. I love the patches. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, high risk, high reward uh, NCO, but. Uh, it pays off uh, when you know the game, when you know what your opponent wants uh, to do, or uh, you study the battlefield and you can just take a shot, uh, knowing that uh, if your opponent is doing what he's doing right now, he probably have this card, so it's uh, a big chance that you can just discard it and completely ruin his uh, battle plan. 
uh, he's great with uh, rightful here because and again especially against Lannisters or any other faction that has counterplot because you can just uh, declare the patch face token to say counterplot and you declare tactical approach and your opponent has to discard counterplot or any other card that blocks other cards from uh, resolving and then you have clear way to play just tactical approach with which is one and very powerful card uh, it's very good against great john when he, uh, that player is positioning himself to do a charge and you know what he can have the berserker tactic uh, so throwing discarding this card can really really mess his plans and as we know the berserker tactics is very powerful against baratheons uh, you can of course as you said miss all your tokens but this is still valid information for for the player who uh, run the patch phase because now you know that Europa does not have this card and you can play around it. Yeah, I think I think he's really good. And as you mentioned, you know, the more you learn about the game and understand those game situations when to use him, you will get more, more out of him. I like him for that reason. I think good players should always be rewarded in this game. And that'll be it for the Stannis side. So again, pay attention for the Renly side video that will complement this video. The Baratheons are in two segments, but this was the end of the Stanicide. And talking to you, I have learned a lot about playing against Stanicide, and I'm a little bit intrigued to explore the faction a little bit further. I have a Baratheon army, and I've been interested in giving the Stanicide a try. I think I think you might have convinced me. Is there is there any other convincing you want to do to our listeners? Just like a final thought with. Uh, you know, what to do with Stannis and, and how to get past some of the beginning frustrations, because I imagine a lot of people jump into this faction and they burn themselves to death and don't get rid of their opponents. What, what would you suggest for people kind of just getting started? To try to find your uh, best combination of units, uh, to try to uh, find your best combination, the best your, uh, commander, and don't, uh, don't let the one bad game uh, make you sad because I know that sometimes uh, the stunning style so wounding yourself, sacrificing your unit for greater good sometimes that style will uh, play against you but with experience with more games you will find your way to just grind down opponent all right, that's solid advice. So keep fighting the good side for the Stannis side. M my daughter's saying, "Have fun." Well, that was that was really nice of her. <laughs> All right. So this is Brett Shevster and Eris apparently telling you guys to go play Stannis and have fun. So I just want to say thank you again to our faction ex expert Shevster. Really appreciate him coming here and sharing the expertise, not just with me but with you guys as well. If you're finding this content to be valuable. Uh, you're picking up some nice tips along the way. Make sure you give a like and subscribe to our channel. We plan to do a full release of all the factions overviews just like this. Um, if we see any updates, we're going to get those supplemented onto those videos as well to keep you guys up to speed as the game develops. Um, as far as the Stannis side goes, uh, it's pretty cut and dry. Stannis being the generally more offensive side, more aggressive side of the faction. Uh, we hope that this gives you some ideas on how to get the most out of your Stannis lists. And uh, thanks again for listening, but give us a like and subscribe. We really appreciate you.